Hey, this is Charles with Rocky Mountain ATV MC. Today I'm going to show you how to clean and inspect your disassembled Razor XP1000 engine. You're watching part three of our engine rebuilding series for the Razor 1000 motor. And in this video, we're going to show you how to clean and inspect all of your disassembled parts. So to do that, we're going to use some contact cleaner. It's probably going to take a couple cans, but we have a few just in case. We also need some safety glasses, rubber gloves, rags. We have soft brushes for cleaning, and we also have our gasket scraper and some Scotch-Brite. Throughout this process, we're going to take several measurements. So we're going to use a pen and paper to write those down. And to take those measurements, we're going to be using feeler gauges, snap gauges, a straight edge, micrometers, and a dial indicator. If you don't have micrometers, then you might have to get by just by doing the visual inspections and using a set of digital calipers. The digital calipers aren't quite as accurate, but it's going to let you know if you have any major concerns. Now, as we go through the cleaning process, we're going to use an oil pan to catch everything that's coming off of our parts. And then to help clean up the cylinders, we're going to use a ball hone and a nylon brush. And if you need these or gasket scrapers, any chemicals, they're available on our website. And now that we have all these things out of the way, let's go ahead and jump into this. To start out the cleaning process, we need to remove any remaining gasket material on any of these engine surfaces. Now keep in mind, the stator cover has a bearing you wanna cover up because you don't wanna get any of those little pieces into the bearing. And after you've cleaned all of the gas gasket material off, you wanna clean up the silicone sealant from the case halves. And when you do this, it is possible to get some of that down into the oil passageways. So be really careful about that. You don't wanna do that. But if you do, what you can do is remove the plugs for those oil galleys and you can use a pipe brush to clean it out and some contact cleaner. So when you reinstall these plugs, you're gonna to wanna to check with the manual and apply any sealant that you need to these plugs and you wanna make sure they're torqued down to spec. Now, as you go through the process, you wanna check all of the parts for visible wear or damage like pitting, galling, or any signs of overheating and make sure all the machine surfaces like the cam journals and crank journals are smooth. And I do wanna point out when you clean these case halves, you don't wanna use any pneumatic tools. This is a machine surface and you don't wanna damage it. Now that we have all of our parts cleaned up, we can start taking some measurements and inspecting all of the components. So we're gonna start with our valve train components and we're gonna look at this intake cam sprocket and we'll be looking at these teeth, make sure that none are chipped or broken. If you have any damaged teeth, you wanna replace this part. Now with the camshaft, we're gonna take a couple of different measurements on it. We're gonna measure the height of each lobe and again, the intake cam is gonna be different than the exhaust cam. We'll write those measurements down and then for the journals, we'll take an X and a Y measurement, write those down. That's gonna help us figure out our camshaft oil clearance later on. We'll talk about that more when we're looking at the cylinder head. So I'll take my micrometer and we'll measure from the base to the top and we'll write that measurement down. Now, when you write these down, make sure you keep the intake measurements separate from the exhaust camshaft measurements. Now I mentioned earlier, we have a separate video for the cylinder head, but we are gonna measure the cam cap inside diameter right now. And that way we can get the oil clearance for our camshafts. So what we're gonna do is set the cap cam cap into place. If you don't want to use this method, you could use plastic gauge instead. And we're torquing these bolts to seven foot pounds. All right, so now we'll use the snap gauge to measure this bore. And when you do this, what you're going to want to do is center this up in there and you'll measure it with the micrometer. And I'd recommend doing this a few different times for each bore and make sure you're getting a consistent reading. And that way you know that the measurement is accurate. Now, once you have all your measurements written down, what you'll do is calculate the camshaft oil clearance. Now what that is, so these are just plain bearings and they rely on oil pressure. 
This camshaft, it runs on a thin film of oil that actually separates it from this metal in here. And it needs to be correct for everything to work properly. If it's not, everything's gonna wear out even quicker. It's just gonna accelerate. So to figure that out, you're gonna take this inside measurement right here and you'll subtract this outside diameter measurement from it and that's gonna give you your clearance. Now, if either of these are out of the service limit, you need to replace either component. So if this is wrong, you're gonna to have to replace the complete cylinder head, but if it's just the camshaft, you'll just replace that. The other thing that can happen is both of these could be within service limits, but your oil clearance is too big. So in that case, you can check and see if you can just replace the camshaft and if that would bring it back to the correct clearance. Moving on to some of the other engine components, we're gonna check this stator cover. We have this bearing right here. And I mentioned earlier about making sure you don't get any gasket material down in there. You don't want this thing sticking up. So I'm just making sure that it rotates freely by hand. That one's good. So we have here a starter torque limiting gear. And on this, you know, there's a lot of different measurements in the manual and we're really just gonna cover the most important things. So you're looking for broken teeth on this and this shaft, if there's any grooves on it or if it fits loose in here, then you know that you either need to replace this limiting gear or this shaft. And then you're also gonna wanna check the bearing surfaces where the shaft rides. So right here in the stator cover, make sure that's in good condition. If there's a ton of free play in there, you know it's bad. And there's also the other side that goes on the engine case. And then moving on, so we have our flywheel here and it has the starter clutch on the back side of it. So we're gonna check this operation. We're gonna rotate this clockwise and it should rotate freely. And as soon as you try to go backwards, it needs to lock up. If you can spin it backwards, then you know that one-way clutch is bad and needs to be replaced. And just really quick, I'll pull this off so you can see it. Just a bunch of roller bearings in there that jam up when you try to go backwards with it. Now, on this gear right here, we have a bushing in there. You just wanna inspect the bushing. If there's any vis visual signs of excessive wear, you wanna replace this. Now underneath that flywheel, we have these timing chain sliders and these parts I have out here, we're just doing a visual inspection. So for the sliders, we just wanna make sure that that cam chain didn't make any deep grooves in it. If these sliders have deep grooves, you definitely wanna replace them. Also on top, back to the valve train components, these buckets, you just wanna look for major damage or scoring to them. If this happened, then you're gonna have serious problems with your cylinder head and you'll need to take a closer look at that. But a lot of times these are okay. These need to spin freely when they are installed on the cylinder head. Now, another thing, these intake boots, a lot of times you can get some cracks going through them. You wanna make sure there's no cracks. You don't want any vacuum leaks and that could destroy the work we're doing right now. Also check the sealing surface for any damage. On the bottom of the engine, we have this oil pickup screen. You wanna make sure that this isn't damaged and is not blocked by anything. And moving on, we have the oil pump. So main thing we're checking on the oil pump, we already did an oil pressure test before we tore, the, tore this motor apart. And if you need to know how to do that, we have a separate video on it. But while this is apart, we're really just inspecting these teeth on this gear and making sure none of them are broken. And then we'll also take a look at this chain Make sure it doesn't have any broken or damaged links. You also want to check your engine case next to where this normally rides. And if the chain's been wearing into it, you want to get that chain replaced. This is the counterbalancer shaft. We'll check the teeth on this as well. Make sure none are damaged. And then we're actually going to take a couple of measurements on it. So we have our two journals. We'll do the X and Y measurements on this, write them down and compare them to spec. The next thing we're gonna do is inspect our crankshaft. On this, we have two sprockets, one for the oil pump and one for the cam chain. You wanna make sure all these teeth are in good condition. And then also on the cam chain, you wanna check the links, make sure none are broken, and also make sure that the chain doesn't bind up. But I do recommend replacing this anytime you're in here anyway. Now, as far as measurements go on the crankshaft, you have some numbers right here. 
So this one is all G's. Each letter corresponds to one of these journals. And we'll talk more about that with bearing selection. But at this point, we need to determine if we can reuse this crankshaft or not. So all we're gonna do right now, we'll measure each journal. So we have our main bearing journals, four of those, and then you have two rod bearing journals. We'll do the X and Y measurements, write them down and compare them to spec. Now, if all those measurements are within spec, then you know you're good to reuse this crankshaft. And just keep in mind, while you're taking these measurements, you wanna stay away from these holes right here. So I'm gonna go right in between them for my Y measurement. Now I started out with both ends and that way I can put them on some V blocks. It's gonna make it a little bit easier to access the rest of the journals to get them measured. So I'm gonna go through get these measured up and then we'll check this for true. The next thing we're gonna do is check the run out on our crankshaft. Now to do that, we're using a dial indicator and magnetic base. We have this on our device, that way it stays stable. Now where you need to have these V blocks are this very end journal. So this is gonna be the mag side. And then by the PTO side, the second journal in is where your other V block is gonna go. And then I just wanna point out that we have our dial indicator set up on this machine surface right on the end. We'll rotate this over slowly and we wanna make sure that the needle moves less than one thousandth of an inch. If it's over that limit, then you need to replace the crankshaft. Now, as you can see, our crankshaft is well within the service limit. So we're gonna go ahead and move on to measuring the connecting rods. Now to get this connecting rod measured up, we're gonna start with the small end on this. So I'm just gonna put a rag in the vise and have the vise hold this for me. Just wanna be really careful to not damage this rod. Now when we measure it, we're gonna do the same thing with the snap gauge. We're gonna do an X and Y measurement and compare those to specs. And again, since it is a snap gauge, you wanna do this measurement a few different times and make sure you're getting a consistent reading to make sure this is accurate. Now, when you take this next measurement, just keep in mind that there's some oil grooves. You don't wanna get in those. Now that we have those measurements taken, we'll move on to the big end. So I'm gonna flip this upside down and we're actually gonna torque this cap on there. We'll torque it to 13 foot pounds. And when you put this on, make sure that you have the serial number matched up. And the other thing we wanna pay attention to this has a number two. So the number two, this is gonna be the side of the rod that faces the exhaust. That's gonna give us our spec. So your book, it's gonna give you a different spec for what number is in that position. Now that we have this connecting rod cap torqued down, I'm gonna move it up just a little bit. And we're gonna take those X and Y measurements again, and we'll write them down. And if everything's within spec on this, then that means we can get some new plane bearings for this that match the number two, and we'll be good to go. After that, we can remove the connecting rod cap. Keep in mind, we're replacing these torque to yield bolts for this cap, and we have to do that to get the correct torque for reassembly. And now we'll do these same steps on the other connecting rod. So right here we have our other case half and on these case halves, we're gonna make sure that we have good flow through all the oil passageways. So we're gonna use contact cleaner to spray through them. And this one right here is for the oil jets. So I'm gonna spray through that. And when I do it, it should be spraying out through both jets. And another thing you wanna keep in mind while you're cleaning these case halves is you wanna get any dirt and debris off of them that didn't come off when you power washed it. So to do that, we're gonna use a toothbrush and some contact cleaner, and we'll scrub it down before we do the final cleaning. Now at this point, we have everything cleaned up pretty good, but we also wanna pay attention to the threads on our case half. And what you can do to clean these up is use a thread chaser. Now what these do, they clean out the threads, any threads that are damaged, it's gonna help restore them, or if you had any debris get down in there. And that way, when we go back together, the bolts are gonna go in nice and easy and you're gonna get the correct torque on them. To use this, I'm gonna put a light oil on these threads and then we're just gonna run this down each of the bolt holes. And if you need one of these kits, they come with all the different sizes 
for your engine. So be sure to check one out on our website. Now, if you do run into one of these bolt holes that this tool, it doesn't want to screw down in easy, you're just going to take a wrench and you'll work it past that rough spot, go forward, maybe a quarter of a turn and then back it off and then keep working it forward. And then once you're through that rough spot, you can verify that everything is smooth. So once you're done cleaning all these bolt holes, you can do the final cleaning and spray everything off really good. Now that we have our gaskets scraped, our crankcase halves are cleaned up, we're gonna focus on some of the smaller parts. So I just wanna point out, you don't wanna spray any chemicals on your rubber parts. So I'm getting that out of the way. And then everything else, we're gonna clean these up really well. On the camshafts, you do have oil passageways. You wanna spray through those. And then same thing on the crankshaft. And we're actually gonna run a brush through on the crankshaft. Moving on to the cylinder, we cleaned this gasket surface and the outside of the cylinder, but we also need to get these cylinder bores clean. So to do that, what your manual will tell you is to never hone these out. So if that's the route you're gonna go, you'll use some maroon Scotch-Brite and just go in the same direction of the crosshatch pattern and use a little contact cleaner with this and get that carbon buildup out of the top of the cylinder. And one more thing I wanna point out, if you just use the Scotch-Brite, get rid of that carbon, you're also gonna to wanna to use this nylon brush and some soap and water to do the final cleaning in that cylinder and get everything out. But for us, we'll go ahead and start with the honing. So what we're gonna do is put this cylinder in the vise. Now, keep in mind this vise we have here, we have soft jaws on it and we're also gonna use a rag. And then we're just gonna lightly clamp the side where our cam chain normally goes. All right, so we have our hone in the drill. We're gonna put some light penetrating oil on it. And we're also gonna put some of this oil in the cylinder. Now, this hone right here, it's not aggressive like some of the other hones out on the market. Now, when we use this hone, we're gonna use a slower speed on our drill. And then as we go through the process, so what we're gonna do, we're gonna run it through there real quick. That removes the glazing on the cylinder and restores that crosshatch pattern. And what that crosshatch pattern does is help retain oil. If you can see any of the old cross hatching in your cylinder still, you wanna to try to maintain those same angles. So you're gonna be anywhere from 30 to 45 degrees. And we'll just go through a few times. It doesn't take very long to do this. We'll get in and out. We're not trying to take off a ton of material. We're just trying to deglaze the cylinder. Once we've done that, we'll go ahead and do the same thing on the other cylinder. Now that we've ran the hone through both cylinders, we'll remove it from the vise. We're gonna spray all this oil down into our drain pan. And then once all the oil's removed, we're gonna use some soapy water and our brush to finish cleaning these bores out. We're also gonna run a brush through the rest of the holes, including this oil passageway. Now, the reason we're cleaning these cylinders out so well is any material that's left in here will destroy any work we're doing now. Now, once we've washed it out really good, we're just gonna rinse it off with regular water. Once you clean it out, we'll dry it off and then we're gonna apply some light oil to the cylinders. All right, the next thing we need to do is inspect our crankcase halves. And what we need to do on this is look at these surfaces where the plane bearing seat, and we need to make sure those surfaces aren't damaged. If they are, it should be pretty obvious. So if you had a spun bearing, you're gonna have some grooves and galling. So you might even have some material that transferred over. So if you have any damage to these surfaces right here, then you need to replace the crankcase halves. Now, the other thing, you wanna make sure the oil passageways are free and clear. So spray some solvent through them. And then once all the oil and everything's out of this, you can actually run some water through it to help make sure everything's cleaned out. And the other part, you'll need to check this for any cracks or damage. If this thing's cracked, again, you're gonna to have to replace it. Now, moving on to these plain bearings, you're gonna to wanna to replace them any time that you have this engine apart, but we're gonna look at them really quick just to see what was going on. And for ours, we had this coating we wore all the way through to the copper coating underneath on our connecting rod bearings. So definitely time to get these swapped out. The main bearings for the crankshaft, 
they actually just had normal wear on them. And then the countershaft bearings actually had some material or particles that were embedded into the bearing. So we might have had a little bit of dirt or metal shavings or something, but that got embedded to those. So it's definitely a good thing we're replacing these bearings. And like I mentioned, anytime you're in here, you want to replace these. It's really critical to have the correct tolerances in here because if you get a bearing that is too tight on the crankshaft, it's going to seize it up. Now, on the other hand, if you get one with too much clearance, you're going to have a lot of noise and vibration coming from your engine. Now that we have our parts inspected, we need to make sure that we're installing the correct bearings when we reassemble this machine. So this code on the end of the crankshaft, it's six digits long. Ours is all G's. It is possible to have a different code. So make sure you pay attention to that. And each one of these G's corresponds to a specific journal on the crankshaft. So starting with the mag side, this is our number one position. So this is a G and then all the way through, counts down to six on the PTO side. And each letter starting with the first one to number six corresponds to those journals. Now we're also gonna have a six digit code on the upper crankcase half. This number might be a little hard to see, but just right along here, it's six numbers. So ours is 212112. The first four numbers of that are what we're concerned about. The last two numbers are for the countershaft balancer bearings, and those bearings are actually all the same. So we don't need to worry about that. Only the first four digits, and those correlate to the four main bearings on the crankshaft. Now I've gone ahead and flipped this uppercase half over, and how the six digit code correlates to this case half is from left to right, you're gonna have your number one, two, three, and four position. This is gonna be the PTO side. This is your mag side. And then five and six are these positions. Again, you don't need to worry about those numbers. So if we plug that in from left to right, this is gonna be two, one, two, one. We can then take those numbers and the numbers from the crankshaft. We'll plug them into the formula from the manual and that's gonna give us the correct bearing sizes. The last numbers we need to write down are the numbers that are laser etched into the connecting rod caps. So ours both have a two in the ends, but keep in mind these could be different and you wanna match that up with your serial number right there. So this one's 667, this is our PTO side connecting rod. So write those down and then we'll use that in conjunction with the letters on this crankshaft and that's gonna determine our bearing size. And now that we have all of our codes written down, I do wanna point out it's critical that all these parts are within spec. So if you had any measurements on your crankshaft or connecting rods that were out of spec, these components need to be replaced before you figure out the bearings that are gonna go back in. So now we need to figure out which bearing goes where. You're gonna have three options for each journal. So you'll have either a yellow, a blue, or a green bearing. They're all three are different sizes. So it's really important to get the correct bearing in the correct spot. So to figure this out, we've got all of our numbers and letters written down. So our magneto side rod is a number two. So we're gonna plug that in along with our magneto side journal on the crankshaft. So that's the second position on the crankshaft. And that letter that goes with it is a G. So we'll plug the G and the two into the formula in the manual. And that actually gives us a green bearing for that position. So this number two spot on the crankshaft, we're using a green connecting rod bearing. Now to figure out the main bearings, our number one spot on the crankshaft, it's gonna be a G. So we'll take that and then the number one spot on the crankcase half is a two. So we plug the two and the G into the formula in the service manual. And what that gives us is another green bearing for the main journal. So number one spot, that's gonna be a green bearing. Now moving on to the second main bearing, that's the number three spot on the crankshaft. That's gonna be a G. So we plug the G, go to the number two spot on the crankcase half, that's a number one. So we plug the one and the G into the formula and that actually gives us a blue main bearing. So number three spot, blue main bearing right here. 
make sure you write all this stuff down as you go through the process and you don't screw anything up. And then we'll just repeat these same steps for the other connecting rod and other main bearings. Now moving on to the cylinders, we need to make sure that we can reuse these. So we need to inspect this Nicosil coating. Now what this coating is, is a really thin, hard material. And if it's worn through or damaged, you need to either recoat these cylinders or replace them. And how to tell is you look for any visual signs of damage, but you can also run your fingernail across, especially where the piston skirts ride on the front and back of the cylinder. That's usually the places this is gonna be worn out. So if you run your fingernail across that and it catches on anything, that's a good indicator that this Nikka seal is worn out. The other thing we can do is actually measure the cylinders and make sure they're not too far worn down. So to do that, what we're gonna do is take X and Y measurements. So we're gonna take one measurement from front to back, and then the other measurements are gonna be side to side. And these measurements, we're gonna take them a half inch down from the top, one in the middle, and then the bottom one is gonna be a little over one and a half inches up from the bottom. So we'll do that on both cylinders, write all those measurements down, and then the service limit for out of round and for taper is one thousandth of an inch. So if your out of round or taper exceeds that limit, then you need to recoat these or replace the cylinders. Now to take these X and Y measurements, I'm gonna use a snap gauge and micrometer to do it. If you have a dial bore gauge, that's probably your best and fastest option but I realize a lot of guys out there aren't gonna have that, so we're gonna do it the old way and use the snap gauge. And again, when you do it this way, you wanna take several different measurements in one position, make sure you're getting a consistent and accurate reading. Now, once we've taken these measurements and if nothing's out of spec, you don't have too much taper, too much wear, or too much out of round, then we'll go ahead and check it to make sure that it's not warped. Now to check our cylinder for warpage, what we're gonna do is use a straight edge. So right here, we just have a ruler with a machined edge. And then I have a feeler gauge at the service limit, which is two thousandths of an inch. And we're gonna try to insert this at all the spots, all the way across the ruler. And then we'll also check diagonals. So if you exceed the service limit at any point, then you know that the cylinders need to be replaced. Now the last things we'll inspect are our pistons, rings, and our wrist pin. Now normally anytime you're in this motor, you're gonna be replacing these parts, but on the rare occasion that you might rerun something, we'll show you how to check it. So to do this, to measure the outside diameter of the piston, what we're gonna do is we'll make a mark 10 millimeters up from the bottom of the skirt, and that's where we're gonna take our measurement from. And we'll write that measurement down and you compare that to the measurement to the corresponding cylinder that it goes to. And that's how you get your piston to cylinder wall clearance. Next, we'll measure the piston pin bore inside diameter and we'll just use a snap gauge and micrometer to do that. Now for this piston pin bore, we're also doing an X and Y measurement. After that, we can measure our wrist pin. We're doing X and Y on that as well. And then we'll do it the X and Y measurements in three positions all the way throughout the piston pin. Moving on to the piston rings, I'm only gonna measure the top two rings. I'm not gonna worry about measuring anything with the oil control rings. So on this, I'm gonna install our top ring first, and you wanna make sure that it's in the correct cylinder that it came out of. And this needs to be 15 millimeters down from the top. So what I'm gonna do is just use the piston and go all the way to the end of the oil control ring where that groove is, and that's gonna be just about 15 millimeters. And we'll just make sure it's all squared up. So right, right about there. So now that we have the piston ring in the correct spot, we're gonna check the end gap. Now, if you have an end gap that exceeds the service limit, then you know these rings are worn out and need to be replaced. All right, now that we have this top ring measured, we'll do the same thing to the second ring and for the rings on the other cylinder. Now, I do wanna point out what happened to ours. We actually had these piston rings stuck on here. There was a ton of carbon 
and the rings couldn't expand like they should and weren't making as good of seal as they should. So not only are these rings worn out, but they're stuck. So we need to take care of that. We're replacing the piston and rings. So even though this piston isn't in the worst condition, I don't wanna take any chances on rerunning it. We're already this far into the engine. Our rings are worn out. We need to replace this stuff. So that's it to doing this job, cleaning and inspection. We have all of our measurements written down so we can get the correct parts and any O-rings, that kind of thing. You wanna make sure you're getting those as well. If you need any parts for your machine, check out our website. We have a lot of different options, both OEM and aftermarket. We also offer free shipping on orders over $75. Now, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's where you're gonna watch the rest of this rebuild series. And we have a lot of other helpful content on there as well. Thanks for watching. <music>